Are we live? Are we live? Are we ready? Good evening. Good evening. Oh, what if we had some music though to get us hopping and percolating? Let's see if we are folks are ready. What up, what up, what up, people? It is April 8th. Already it's April. OMG. Uh, we trying to get things set up here. Let's see. Let's see. We want to make sure we can see all the comments that are going to come in because you all are ready for an amazing experience, a truly dope experience, a dismantling oppression, pushing education experience. As we launch a new venture, it's just going to be episode one. How many episodes will there be? We don't know because uh, this is for the public to decide. But we are launching Lessons Unlearned, writing and rewriting the school experience, where we get into it with various educators and various sandboxes about what we are learning from the impact of COVID on the educational sector around lessons that we need to leave in the past, honey. We don't need to return to normal with those because what was normalized was already messed up. So I hope you all are ready. I hope you're getting excited. I totally am. Uh, we have an amazing, amazing group of panelists to kick us off tonight. I'm excited. This is going to be a whole like little St. Louis vibe. So if folks ain't ready, you need to, you know, go on and get your chingy, your Nelly. You need to chicken hair one time on a real, real quick because um, we're definitely going to have a good time with our guest today. So we're just going to let people take a few minutes. Um, if you've not joined a StreamYard broadcast before, uh, the housekeeping is that we are in a broadcast studio that is just the four of us. And it was... It's quite COVID safe because we are very distant and you all are in your own places and you are dropping in chats on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, and we'll be able to pick up those comments here. If you're on Facebook Live on Dope is a Verbs page, drop those comments because we want to hear what people are saying. If you're on YouTube, Asia Upchurch, YouTube or Facebook page, drop those comments. We want to hear them. We want to make sure folks are going to be engaging with our amazing, incredible guests. Yes. Um, uh, at any rate, if folks are popping in, welcome, welcome. My name is Aisha Upchurch. I am the chief agitator in charge here, the founder and creative director of Dope is a Verb, where we say dope is a verb because we're taking that expression that commonly comes from like hip hop and colloquialisms where we say something is fly, it's fresh, it's dope as an adjective, but we're flipping it on its head and saying dope has to be a verb. We have to be taking active, present tense, ongoing action. We have to be dismantling oppression and pushing education, not just in formal spaces, but in every place where you are, where you have some light and some knowledge that can get us going into a truly more liberated place. So I'm dope. Our three panelists tonight are super dope. Um, are y'all dope? Are y'all dismantling oppression, pushing education? Do y'all have lessons that you have understood that COVID exposed that we do not need to go back to? Please rock with us tonight and keep us tuned and keep tuned for future episodes. But um, we're going to definitely get in, get ready to get into it because I'm super hyped to get it going with our guest today. And I want to make sure that we have time to take all of your questions and comments. And so I'm going to go ahead and get ready to introduce our amazing guest. I don't think y'all are really ready. Y'all are not really ready. I know my fam is on here. Do I got any other Metro Academic Classical High School homies checking us on Facebook? What up to that black and white and sometimes gold? You know what that is? All right, so I am going to get us ready to um, meet this amazing panel. Um, I, I hope you all are ready. I, I don't know. I don't know if folks really are excited as I am. You should be. You really should be. Um, I'm just getting my screens ready. Okay. So, hey, what's up? What's up? What's up? We got some family on here. Woo, woo. 
Um, okay, I'm super excited. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm going to introduce our guest. And um, y'all put your virtual hands together because these, I've, I'm in the, I got my crown on because I am sitting and supping with queens tonight. And I don't know if y'all got y'all crowns where y'all are, but y'all need to get them ready. So our first guest. All right, here we go. Um, Kimberly Berry. Kimberly Berry is a 20 year veteran teacher, like 20 years, that's dope already, in the Ferguson Florissant School District. Her commitment to and centering of compassion, optimism, and integrity in her practice are the reason she was St. Louis American Salute to Excellence and Education Award winner in 2016. Kimberly is a proud graduate of Metro Academic and Classical High School, class of 93, where she was on the track team. She has kept this hobby going, combining it with her commitment to young girls, serving as the Girls on the Run head coach and site liaison at Bermuda Elementary. She is a current Girls on the Run board member and Black Girls Run ambassador. In 2016, Barry received the inaugural Energy Award. She earned her BS in early childhood education from the University of Missouri St. Louis and also her Master's of Education from there, where she was also an adjunct from 2008 until 2014. This Black Panther is a champion educator with the little ones truly running with the little ones, and she is truly running this marathon for equity and community engagement. Kimberly's North Stars, North Stars, those folks who keep us kind of Motivated to keep moving, her North educational North Stars are Mary McLeod Bethune, ooh, and this one I also share with Kimberly, Marion Wright Edelman. Y'all, put your real hands, put your virtual hands together to for Kimberly Barry. Woo! And what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, we got Kimberly. What's up, what's up, uh, what's up, what's up, Woo. Okay, so, all right. And I'm professional. All right. Our next guest. You won't be seeing double, folks. <laughs> Born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, Mrs. Alana Johnson is a 1993 graduate of Metro High School. In 1997, she earned her BS in mathematics from Xavier University in New Orleans and earned her master's degree in secondary education. Mrs. Johnson has taught for over 15 years, mentored young people, tutored, served as class sponsors, and helped to relaunch the Mu Alpha Theta Math Honor Society at her former school. She loved math, I can tell you that. Currently, Mrs. Johnson is a high school math teacher at Grassfield High School in Chesapeake, Virginia, where she continues to inspire the next generation of students to be all they were destined to be. Her educational North Stars are Dr. Camille Jones and Ron Clark. Y'all, put your hands together for Alana Johnson. Also, she has the pleasure of looking like her baby sister. You're welcome. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And last but certainly, certainly not least, our final panelist, Mrs. Deanna Ash, has worked for special school district for the for the special school district for the ten year for ten years. She has taught primarily in special education classrooms. She is also a graduate of Xavier University in New Orleans with a bachelor of science degree in biology. She earned a master's of teaching from Fontbonne University in special education, mild, moderate, cross-categorical disabilities, and also holds a reading specialist certification. She has been very active throughout her teaching career, participating in the Teacher Leadership Academy and Teacher Advisory, and serving as a data team leader, new teacher facilitator, and professional development committee member. Mrs. Ash ignites her students' interest by creating learning opportunities that are challenging, meaningful, and relevant. She believes that teachers must embrace change, encourage innovation, and foster creativity, not just in their students, but in themselves. And Deanna's Educational North Stars, her Educational North Star is former superintendent of Jennings School District, Tiffany Anderson. You all, please put your hands together for my cousin, Eh, 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 eh. Ooh, ooh, can 
bang your screens, handle all of this black girl magic. I don't think so, but we're going to try. Um, okay, that's an original composition. So <laughs> for YouTube and Facebook can't try to take it down. That's I go, I own the rights to that ditty that I just did. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. You're welcome. What's up, my fellow Metro alum? What's up? What's up? Hello. 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 What's up? Okay, truly. Hello. For folks who don't know, we are all proud graduates of Metro High School in St. Louis, Missouri. Some of us are from the, what was that, Washington? Uh, no, McPherson. No, I'm a McPherson person. What was the original location? Of what? Metro? Of Metro. It, oh, it was oh. Um, off of Kings Highway at the uh, Jewish. Um, what was the street? Um Oh my gosh, there's got to be a comment. What was the. Oh my gosh. Delmar, Kings Highway. No, no, no. Yes. Washington. Oh, I knew my sister would know. Washington. Put it in there. Yes. So, 2017 Washington. So, yes, we all are graduates of uh, the Mexico. original. Okay. You know, I was the first class that moved oh. over to McPherson. Oh, um, okay. We're not old, but our school mascot is the Panthers. So, truly, everyone is blessed because y'all are talking to some dope Black Panthers, Wakanda forever tonight um, to drop some gems as we get into this topic of lessons unlearned, writing and rewriting the school experience. Again, we don't know how many episodes it's going to be, but we know this topic is relevant and real. And so we are sure there go there's going to be more. So for folks joining us, um, listen, you working with a lot of Black Panthers, wink, wink. What that means is we're going to try to hold this to an hour by hour 15, but we understand if that means something different and you got to either stay or go, you know, you loiter as you want to. Okay. Um, <laughs> but also, um, I want to just say that I feel so honored to just be able to have this opportunity to lift up you all's voices. You all are current in what I call the sandbox educators. And we know that teachers are expected to be unfairly expected to be Swiss army knives. And so I just want to say from my mouth, and my screen to your ears, your hearts and your screens that I see y'all, I appreciate y'all. You all don't, you need more than an appreciation week, one week out of the year. Um, and so, especially in these new um, virtual and, so, and physically distant learning times, like y'all are the true MVP. So I put my crown on, but if I could have sent a crown to each of you all, you should really be wearing them. Um, so, okay. I have a couple of questions prepared and we are going to have time to take some questions and comments from those joining us on the virtual worlds. Um, but I have some questions for us, but before we get into the thick of it, yes, we know equity, access, community and family engagement. These are very real, not just words, but these are real experiences and, and, and opportunities to chance to tackle. But before we get into that, we just need to like, at the stage. So we're all 314 born and raised, whether we are dispersed from there or not. So I'm going to put this question out to you all. And I'm going to start with um, Deanna and I'm, then I'm going to circle around. So I want you all to, you know, pretend like we're back in the multi-purpose room at Metro, <laughs> playing spades, cutting those skills where, you know, if you think long, you think wrong. And I'm going to ask you your gut reaction to this question. These are St. Louis people questions only. Deanna, how do you get the bomb pop man to stop? You run after it and you say, hey, hold up. Bomb pop man, bomb pop man, wait. Yes, yes, yes. Boom. So if people don't know, we run after our, um, we don't call him the ice cream truck or the good humor. They the bomb pop man. And you say, ho. Oh. Okay. Ho. Oh. Oh. Very oh. good. Okay. Alana, I'm going to say, man, I'm really thirsty for a soda. What brand should I drink? There's no other brand but Vess. V-E-S-S, -S, baby. <laughs> There's no other brand. Vess, soda, okay? Great These strawberry, whatever you like. <laughs> These are educated women, okay? Yes. Right. 
Okay, Kimberly. Ooh, ooh, I want to stick my hand in a bag and eat some chips. What am I going to eat? Let's get some Red High Ripplets. Okay. <laughs> or if you feel it real excited, get you some um the Red Hot, the, the um corn chips. I can't remember the brand. Ooh, I know what you're talking about. Uh -huh. The yeah. Old Vienna. Yeah, right, Old, Old Vienna. Old Vienna. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. But you got to make a mix. Get your uh -huh. Old Vienna corn chips, your popcorn, and some Funyuns, Move and throw in me. maybe a plain chip. That's called mix. That's <laughs> mix. Over checks. You had no idea what we would do in St. Louis. 314 in the house. Three, one, okay, great. <laughs> And we all know if you want pizza, where you got to go? Uh, that's going to be the most. The most. Okay. Yeah. All right. So just so folks know, this, is a, this happens to be, this is not intentionally, but this happens to be a St. Louis affair to jump off. Yes. Um, so <laughs> we got the safe set just to make sure that we all are um, showing love to our city. Um, dang, y'all old school. Well, auntie, I mean, you raised us, so I mean, you know. <laughs> There's something. <laughs> Listen, what do you put in your purple? A peppermint, peppermint stick. Peppermint stick. That's it. <laughs> if that ain't the weirdest, I don't know. Pray for pray for St. Louis. Because we've been putting that peppermint stick in a purple for years. But you know what? We just elected our first African American woman mayor, <laughs> Tashara Jones. Let's go, St. Louis. Stand up. Let's go. Let's Let's go. So awesome. So awesome. Black yes. women. Black women. That was a full dissertation. That was the answer to the question. <laughs> That's that is the question. That's the answer. Okay. So um, all right. So let's get into it, you all. You all, we can do this like double dutch style. So the when the rope is turning and you feel like you want to jump in, you just go on and answer the question for this one, right? So quickly, uh, would love to hear for you all to share with folks what got you all into teaching. So this don't have to be the whole like biopic version, but like what's the commercial break version of what got you all into teaching? So for me, it was a very personal experience. My three youngest babies all were diagnosed with speech and language disorders. So going through that experience with them, I felt like I needed to become, of course, their advocate. So as we went along that journey, I just became even more empowered to advocate for others with special needs. That's good. Um, for me, it wasn't right away. Um, people ask me this, my students ask me this, and it wasn't right away growing up. And I know I have family on here. Um, I <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to be two things at the same time. I wanted to be a lawyer and a cosmetologist. I don't know, um, but I just I just just wanted to do that. And so um, I think for me, mine just came. Um, I, I can't even say. I've always had a passion for learning. I've always had a passion for teaching. 2001 was my first year teaching at an alternative school, which really has been the foundation for me. I just took the job because I kind of was at a crossroads coming out of grad school, having a new baby. I was like, I don't know what I want to do anymore. And so I, I landed a job at an alternative school, which literally changed, which I can talk a little bit more about, but literally changed how I saw education. Um, as my first teaching job at an alternative school. If anybody has ever taught at one or whatever, it is very challenging. So for me, that that is where this teaching bug grasps. And 20 years later, it is definitely where I'm supposed to be. Um, like a lot, I had a very non-traditional um, journey into education coming out of high school. Uh, my major was biology. I was pre-med. Um, but I always wanted to work with children. So it was like, well, you become a pediatrician. Um, no one in my family um, are educators. And I feel like we really don't recruit, you know, high performing students to become educators because everyone hears about the downside. Right. But um, was on track pre-med, got switched off track, which is another discussion and landed um, in as my major with education. And it's just 
developed me as a human. It's been transformative. Um, I can't, I can say that I live my passion every day. And so it's had some ups and downs, but I'm just grateful to be able to lend what I can um, in order for our students to be successful. Beautiful. And I mean, I think that I, I wonder if this, um, maybe we'll be able to return to this later, but the recruitment, you know, um, and while this isn't one of our key topics today, it's certainly in there, this uh, representation and being able to see self. And we know that as has been the, the statistic, this isn't an Asia data point, this is researched there that um, the majority of writ large across the country, though this may not be the experience, right, in St. Louis and Florissant and Jennings, you know, um, but the predominant uh, kind of racial, ethnic, gender representation of educators in public urban school districts are white women. Um, and so uh, when we know if you don't see yourself, you can't imagine that that's a possibility or even that that is something to aspire to. And so I, I think about how representation might be linked to um, equity, to access, and even to family and community engagement, which are three cornerstones um, to, to spend time with on today. So I heard that nugget and I'm taking a note and I don't know if people got they notebooks or they're writing utensils or whatever down, but I'm definitely ready to um, grab onto some gems. Just a quick little note before we dive into more juicy questions. For those who are on Facebook, um, if you are on the Dope is a Verb page, we'll be able to see your comments here in StreamYard. Um, we're running into an issue that's above my pay grade because <laughs> I ain't got a scope for this. Uh, to resolve around uh, comments that are posted to the Asia Upchurch Facebook page. We can't see those here, but um, our, our guests might not be able to see them here. So um, if you hop over to Dope is a Verb on Facebook, we'll be able to see that. So, all right. So, so you all are in teaching, uh, whether you thought that would be your original path or not. Um, and at this point, you know, Kimberly, you've been teaching for 20 years. Um, Lonnie, I, you know, you're the math person. Excuse me, Alana. I didn't mean to put your family nickname okay. on. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Hey, you've been teaching since 2001. So, oh, you're coming up on this, the big 20 for you. Is, is that Off and on because, you know, I had kids. You know. Still <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I had that's, some kids. That's the one you don't get benefits from. Like right. Exactly. I had some kids in there, so it hasn't been 20 yeah. years straight, but. Yeah. Well, we're going to still call it 20. I checked. And Deanna, you've been teaching for 10. 10. So you all are not new teachers. You're mid-career to established career educators. And so I'm going to ask you all to um, get into a, a time machine of yourself. So you have your present 2021 selves and all that you know. But I'm going to ask you to go back to that first, those key years, whether teachers will stay or leave. It's like that first one to three year window where you're like, I've been hazed, or this is amazing. <laughs> or wait a minute, where's this fine print? So I'm gonna ask you all to go back to those days and I wanna just hear from you all but, uh, two things. What were the immediate like joys and positive possibilities that you found in those early years? And then I'm gonna ask you in those early years, do you remember what you recall as like some challenges? And I'm not talking about like, Ooh, I'm having a hard time staying on schedule, but what are some of the kind of systemic challenges that you remember kind of sniffing out in those early years? Um, well, as I said, I started off at, in 2001, I started off at a uh, alternative school here in the area um, for middle schoolers. Um, I had 10 to 12 students who had been put out of their uh, home middle schools that would come to uh, this school before, you know, they go on to the next step, if they couldn't get rehabilitated, if you will, to go back to their middle school. Um, it was very tough. It, it, there were many times that I thought, okay, I, Lord, I did not hear you correctly. But this year, I stayed there for one year, like I said in the introduction, has transformed me. Because I had these students, I had students, I had a young man who I'll never forget. He was a seventh grader. He was 16 years old in the seventh grade. 
Um, he was probably doing some things that he shouldn't have been doing outside of school time. Um, but he he was my project student. So every year I ask God to give me a, a student that no matter how tough they may be, I want to somehow make some headway with him. Um, and one thing that I loved about being there and, and with this particular student was he loved listening to music. OK, so if I could just get him to listen to music, he would do what I asked. He was low performing, but he would do what I asked him to do. Um, I love the smallness of the classes, though. I did have some students who were emotionally um, having some challenges. Um, I love the intimacy of my class. I love that I was able to do more projects because I only had 12 kids. Um, I love that even on the hardest day, those kids helped to form me. And I think I helped to form them because these kids were used to teachers. When you go to an alternative school, it's not peaches and cream whatsoever. So they were used to getting new teachers probably every six to eight weeks because teachers wouldn't stay. So for me, the intimacy of that small classroom is something that I have held dear um, all through these years. The tough part, which is something that we still struggle with now. And this is a this is probably would need to be another episode because I know we can talk about this and other educators as well, parents as well. The standardized test. So this was at the uh, beginning of No Child Left Behind. This was in 2001. This was at the very beginning of states mandating these standardized tests. Now, mind you, I had these students some I mean, they were in seventh grade performing probably at a second, third grade level. Some were high performing, but just emotionally having some challenges. And I'm thinking, how in the world am I supposed to focus on getting these kids to pass a test? I, I'm just trying to get them to stay awake. I'm just trying. So for me, I think something that has been the most difficult is incorporating what you want to incorporate into lessons, into your teaching philosophy in the midst of trying to teach a test as well. So then I try to uh, play meditation music for the students. I needed to do something because they would come in from PE jumping, literally jumping off the desk pretty much. So I would start to play like just very calming music. We would sit in a circle, not do like a seance or anything, but we would sit in a circle and I literally would just have them breathe and tell me how their day was. The, the upsetting part about that is that my the principal at the time found out that I was doing that. And because I couldn't relate it to an SOL, in Virginia we have in what are called standards of learning, because I couldn't relate that 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 circle time, if you will, to an SOL, I had to stop doing it. Yeah. So that has that has that was devastating to me and really began to open my eyes up to to how this testing can impact students. And then if you go even a further level down, the student that you are teaching in particular, I had low performing students, students from different demographics, students who pretty much some didn't have food to eat. You see what I'm saying? You can go to another level. Like, how are you? So for me, it was great because the intimacy of the class. But then I got introduced to these tests. <laughs> and I was like, what this is? Wait a minute. What is this? And why? Why am I being told that I can't do something that's working because I can't relate it to, you know, SOL 7.2.1? Yeah. So I think that's something that I, I still struggle. I'm going to be honest. I still struggle yeah. with that. I think I don't think anybody and again we'll get into like lessons revealed in 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 conversation with some of those initial kind of joys and 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 challenges from those early years but like I just I don't think anybody's missing standardized test drama right so but um Kimberly or Deanna what about you all rhyming the tape to those earlier years what are those initial joys and even initial like inklings like huh there are larger issues at play that you all remember so for me, um, I was strategically placed in a building where I was considered the newbie, the baby. All of the teachers in my building were veteran teachers. So the joy, the beauty was there were so many nuggets for me to glean from. The support was there. The mentoring was there. So my early years, those formative years were really strong, solid years 
the aha for me came from the fact of just trying to bridge the textbook knowledge to the real day-to-day -day stuff. That was the aha, the weighted vest, um, the social emotional components of de-escalation and all of that real, real stuff was the smack in the face. Hello, welcome to teaching. But I still have no regrets. Lessons learned. Boom. I love it. I love it. And what about you, Kimberly? Um, the joys and still a joy as an early childhood educator is just seeing that light bulb go off um, with students. And it takes a lot of patience and persistence. But once you see students unlock the code of learning how to read or, you know, building those funda foundational math skills, that's what brings me joy. Students wanting to come to school. They're excited. The first day of school, picture day, field trip day, you know, just to experience that has kept me um, as a kindergarten teacher this long. I feel like the aha moments for me was when I realized school was just not a place where students came to learn. Students was a safe place. Stu um, school was a place where students ate all of their meals. They were clothed and they were allowed to be, students are allowed to be themselves. And also school was a place where if they needed help, um, if there's something wrong at home, they will come to the teacher. So that Swiss Army knife, I like that analogy because you do find yourself in a role as a counselor, as a social worker, as a nurse, um, in many different forms. And school doesn't prepare you for that. It's like on the job, job training. So in my early years, I didn't realize, oh, you know, if a child doesn't get to school on time for breakfast, that may have been the last meal they ate since they left school, you know, six or seven hours ago, right? So let me make sure I have some extra food in my classroom for these children to eat, for my students to eat so that they can learn. So I think that continues to be something um, that weighs on my heart, realizing that school is much more than just um, a place of academia. That is so beautifully put. And um, it's I'm, I'm taking note, right? I'm a note taker. I've learned that my ability to recall and hold, <laughs> it has diminished with time. We'll just put it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Totally with you. Yes. So I'm like writing, but now I also, my handwriting is like, what is that? Because um, handwriting, right? Um, but I think that's what I'm, what I'm putting in my joy column from each of you all are the things that I think should always be, right? And I wondered if there are teachers who are now currently within the last two, three years and their first um, part of their teaching career who would also say, I was in a building where I got mentorship from veteran teachers intentionally, or I have small class sizes or, um, you know, teachers, we can, we can use music. We can, you know, engage our students beyond the curriculum. Um, I like to support those light bulb moments from what I call um, Kimberly ankle biters. Cause let's be honest, they're closer to their ankles, to my ankles and my ears. Um, and they're just so cute. Uh, so just thinking about how those joys should always be. Yeah. And then, but what happens is those ahas that you all have pointed out, I imagine that now when your 10 to 20 year experience has been like, oh, oh, this wasn't just a crack right. in the wall. This just wasn't a little, you know, a little pothole on like, you know, the U City side of Del Mar. This is like a pothole on the like uh, Kings Highway <laughs> and Del Mar <laughs> part. Right? Those are two different parts of the same street. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. St. Louis potholes will take your whole axle out. And right. so now, so we're going to go in our time machine into your current day, right? And today, this conversation that we're proposing is having a center around um, equity, around access, around family and community engagement, which again, these are words that we hear and people put like a 
you know, we're all older. Pound sign, which is called a hashtag now. They put that, they put the pound sign in front of that, and then people are woke or they're debating about these. So, you know, I'm listening to how even those issues, maybe before we knew to call them that, were evident in those early years. So now I'm going to ask y'all to put those spades hats on. Because one of the things here we want to do on this platform or what Dope is about is being solution oriented and also not um, just having jargon fly around and people think they know what it means. Yeah. Right. So we're going to build a little communal knowledge here. Right. There's no wrong answer, but don't think too long. Right. So I'm going to ask each one of you all to define one of the words as you now like have an understanding um, so that people don't just be like, oh, equity, you know, that's the um. That's when, you know, like everybody get like, you know, two bags of clothes. And, you know, like, you know, um, family engagement is when your mama come up to the school and yell at you in front of your um, friends. So, you know, we, <laughs> I kid, but I serious. Okay. Right. Um, so we want to take this opportunity to like make sure we are talking about the right thing right now. I know. So, Deanna, I know you also have a visual. So I'm going to try to share the screen. I don't know if. But I'm going to start with you on, we say equity, like, what's the definition, right? I'm going to try to conjure up this image um, as you go. Okay, so equity simply means to ensure each student gets what he needs to meet his educational needs. And this is the driving force behind an IEP, the Individualized Education Plan. And I firmly believe that all students should have an IEP because it necessitates what he or she needs in order to be successful. So when I look at this visual and when I think about equity, Oftentimes, it's easy, maybe, to confuse equity with equality. Equality just sim simply means that everyone has the same thing. So looking at the visual, we see that there's a box. Everyone has a box. But the glaring difference is that equity piece. Equity ensures that the box is designed to meet the student's needs. That's equity. Beautiful. And we got some feedback um, saying great visual. Um, and so I think, Deanna, as you pointed out, like, so the image on the left side, like everybody is receiving the same box. Equality assumes that we all, not the thing that we're receiving, be the same, but equality assumes that we are all the same. And mm -hmm. on, the, on the left, we see these are three different humans. No judgment on if one is better, worse, in between, but they're they are literally factually different. Giving each one the same item does not improve the goal, which is to see this game. Exactly. Equity says instead of this person is already equipped to see this game. This person, because of who they are, how they're shaped and the environment they're in, they need this box. But this person needs two boxes and it doesn't harm this person that this person got two boxes. So this is a really powerful visual. And I thank you for giving us that definition and this image. Um, yes. I really do believe a lot of people are throwing those words around as synonyms. And yes. I'm like, but equity means you're taking something from me. Yo, homie, you ain't even never need no box. Yes. <laughs> that point right there. Right. That's it. Yes. So, <laughs> you. You've been, you still gonna enjoy the game. Yes. Like, eh. <laughs> My friend Wanisha goes, eh. <laughs> so yeah. okay. Deanna, I just I think I, I know we to get some more two cents on equity. Yeah, I think, and I can see some people even in the um, the comments, your breakdown of equity and equality with the visual was was fabulous. Um, and um, like Aisha, you're saying, people are saying equal, equality, equity, equality, equity. 
you know, the mathematician in me, the equal sign cannot go between equality and equity. It can't. You got to do the equal sign with the slash through it. OK, so <laughs> I'm just saying because that's how my mind works. And I think until we as a community, which we're going to get to, I know Kim's going to talk about that, but until we as a community in a society stop putting the equal sign between the two words, we're stuck at this position, kind of like you said, Aisha, some people don't even need the box. They don't even need the box. That doesn't mean that because somebody is getting two boxes to see the game that they're somehow above you. No, <laughs> we're all trying to see the same game. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? All three of those people, they want to see the game. And it's it's not equitable because that's the other. <laughs> it's not equitable for, for, the, for the young person in the purple whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I, I think as we begin to think about solutions, because that's something that we all talked about, we can all sit here and complain and complain and complain. It's now time to, fig time to figure out how do we make this um, solution oriented? How do we in the classroom and in our communities get the boxes uh, for our students? Um, how, how, do we, how do we do that? Um, so I just, Deanna, I just want to, that, that was, that was right on. And with this and this, visual, with this visual, that's, that's right on. And to extend the conversation to, so the effect that COVID has had with equity and equality, right? So if we look at the ballpark, that's the education that's receiving ELA, math, science, social studies, instruction, right? And we see the boxes. So when school shut down, if we look at the left graphic, well, let's just give everybody a device, a Chromebook or what a tablet or something like that. Everyone gets the same thing. But then we realize, oh, well, some families need a hotspot. Some families need a safe space to be in in order for their students to log in every day. So that's where we start adding the boxes mm -hmm. to make sure that all of our students have access to this education, right? That's free for all, no matter where you are, who you are. That's right. You know, it's going to look a little bit different. And I think that that is what has really exposed is that things may be equal, but they're not equitable. Yes. So that and was also, a great yeah. um, conversation. Yeah. And to, to add to that, I think the holistic school system has now had to look at the lens of equity with a laser thin focus because we realized and we, we recognize that we we're off. We've been off. Right. Yeah. But now yeah. it's glaring because we recognize and acknowledge that there are barriers present yeah. and the barriers are, let's call it what it is, being resistant to change, being unaware of the need to adapt, Amen. not Amen. acknowledging the systemic oppression. Uh, and then, you know, some even benefit from a sense of privilege or mm. entitlement as the like image that. depicts. I like yes. that visual, Asia. Yeah, so as Kimberly was talking, right? So, and I and I do apologize for folks. This seems um, fuzzy. I was doing a quick, a quick <laughs> search on the interwebs. You know that teacher, uh, you know Google, uh, PhD, Doctor Google. Um, and so, the beautiful thing, right, is um, so we we went through the equality and the equity, right? And so, what's, we're talking about access, and um, I think some people sometimes also throw access in as a synonym. And these are not just words that live. These are practices. These are experiences that are enacted upon and, 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 and held in people's bodies, real humans. Access um, is not a synonym, but it's like a cousin, right? You know, like how me, Deanna, we cousins, right? We not twins. We're not siblings. But access comes in because like this third, this third image from the, from the left says reality, where now, oh, homie in the um, yellow pants, <laughs> apparently has a lot of access to these boxes, whatever the box yes. symbolizes. Mm -hmm. Homie in the middle has much less access, but has some. 
Mm -hmm. Going to the far right in the purple has absolutely none. And in fact, it's lower prevented from even getting to the base level. So sometimes something is needed. And so, so this is the reality, right? And what we're going to try to talk about now is like in the light of COVID ed, as I like to call it. And we're talking about community and family engagement around access to technology. Students were sent home and told to like, and families were like, what? We homeschooling now? What that revealed about the nature of equity, what that revealed around the nature of who has so much access and why? Why were some school districts sent home with Chromebooks without second thought? And others, it was like a fight, you know? Why are why is engaging families and communities seem so embedded into the ethos of the school system versus in other communities? We are like the homie in the purple on the third picture. That's right. And so as we even ask about solutions, we're gonna ask everybody to put you. I like to hold these close to me, right? I like we're gonna I'm gonna invite my panelists to put on your rose-colored glasses around how can we be radically solution-oriented, even in a time of this where we have an opportunity not to return to this Wahala mess over here, but to imagine what if there were any barriers, period. Yeah. Because this fence is a barrier. Why is the fence there? What does the fence represent mm-hmm. in terms of, of education now? So, um, you know, I love a visual. We're going to pull that down for a second to look at these beautiful faces. And so I'm going to pitch this question out to you all. It's like, okay, so here we are. And I'm going to start with you, Kimberly. Um, Because I know that you've been been engaged in the community. Um, And I know, Lana, you've had some things to talk about this as well, to say about this as well. But what have you, what has stuck out to you when we hear family and community engagement? What has been really declaratively revealed in this time of distance learning around what wasn't working? So one of the things that I always remember is that all families want the best for their children. We always have to keep that at the forefront. Now, how that's executed may look different. You got to say that again. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, oh. Because some people, right? Some people think that only suburban families care about what's happening with nature. So can you just say that again, Reverend, Reverend Barry? Again, one more time. <laughs> All families want the best for their children. How it's executed just may look different. Amen. Based yeah. upon yeah. the needs of that family. So if you are in a, a family that lives in the suburbs, and all of your basic needs are met, and when I say basic needs, I'm talking about food, shelter, love, safety, right? Clothes. Then education can be top tier as far as your involvement coming up to the school or even before your child enters school, having some type of school readiness, um, preschool, parents as teachers, things like that. So when you are living in poverty, your first focus is those basic needs. So education or going to school or being at school may not be top tier. It doesn't mean it's not important. It's not top tier. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do with families who where education is important, but there are some needs that need to be met we need to empower families and show them and bring resources to families to help them with housing, with um, good, decent paying jobs, with child care, with access to health care, things like that. Because back in the day, day, you know, the schoolhouse and the church house, that's where the resources were. Mm. But then we moved mm-hmm. away from that Right. And we left a community of people still in need. So I feel like um, as educators, we have to make sure that everybody um, is allowed that access to a great education. So is it offering uh, free universal preschool for all? Absolutely. Is it offering um, free and reduced lunch for all? Absolutely. You know, is it 
allowing for all schools to have one-to-one technology technology absolutely yes. Yes. you know up-to-date uh, curriculum absolutely and high qualified teachers highly qualified teachers i love everybody but you cannot be someone who just rolls up and say yes i'm a teacher i invested <laughs> lots of money in time for my degrees <laughs> yes yes because if you yes. go to become a doctor you can't just roll up and say hey i'm gonna do this surgery from just reading this book or downloading something from google right the same expectation has to be with teachers and that's why i was talking about recruitment we don't recruit our top tier students to become teachers to become educators we want them to be doctors and lawyers, and that's awesome. Yes. I love it. But we need intelligent, hardworking people to be teachers as well. Ooh, Kim. Yeah. Um, if your toes is feeling crunchy, he yeah, ain't sorry. I don't, don't like even it. know. I don't even yeah. know like yeah. what to yeah. even add to that. You literally you hit so many so things. So many. Like, Mm -hmm. We were we were we were we were going to talk about access to technology as well, which I think you kind of put all that inside of what you just yes. said. Yes. And it goes back to it's so interconnected because it goes back to the first thing about equity and equality. Right. Some people need some boxes out here. <laughs> they need some boxes. And, and I think somebody might say the box might look like. A hot spot. The box might look like free and reduced lunch. The box might look like fill in the blank. We need some boxes and we need the people whose uh, grades are way higher than ours. You know, we need those people to understand and come out of those offices and come back into the community and understand what we are. Saying. We're not saying, you know, take away. Nobody's saying take away. We're mm -hmm. saying give everybody the access so that they can be like you were saying, who are they? Who they were destined to be. I don't mm -hmm. know any parent who's just like, nah, mm -mm. <laughs> I don't want my child to succeed. And nah, nah, nope. Mm -hmm. I don't know any of those. Do we have some parents? We talked about this too. Do we have some parents who need to be empowered? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Do we have some parents? who need some things in the community to help them help their children. Yes, we are not Swiss army knives. Aisha, that analogy, I tell you what, that, that's gonna stick mm -hmm. with me for a long time. We are not Swiss army knives. We, we have, we've been doing that, but we weren't built to do that. So it is so imperative now that we get in contact with and we empower our parents to talk to the school board, to empower our parents to be involved in the community, to empower our parents to know, yes, you're not going to know everything. Geometry, you don't know everything with English. You don't know everything with science. Fill in the blank. But there is a system here for you, whether you live, whether you make twenty thousand dollars a year or two hundred thousand dollars a year. There is a system that is here to help every child succeed and that it fits. Mm -hmm will come down. I mean, the access to technology, as Kim was saying, you can give somebody a hot spot. Do they know how to work the hot spot? That's spot. That's it. Um, That's it. You can send the teachers home to be on Zoom, but do they know what that means? No. Come on. I mean, like you can, you can the access, you know, even if you outfit everybody with what they need, the access has to come with education. The mm -hmm. Access has to come with empowerment. The access, Yanni, you said something we were talking um, when it was just the four of us. Empower, engage. Enlightenment and engagement. Those are the three E's. The three E's. That, that can't be just the teachers doing that. No, that no. has to be the community, the parents, the community. I, I looked up the definition, which we all know the definition, but I looked up the Miriam Webster definition of community, a unified body of individuals, the people with common interests living in a particular area, uh, a group of people with common characteristics. We are a community of people, whether we're black, white, fill in the blank. 
We are a community of people who have a common goal to see our students, our children succeed to their highest capability. Absolutely. And every child cannot do that until we equip them with the boxes. And I hope that as we keep doing this, that people would go into their communities and begin to make waves. Right. And the waves are going to become bigger waves. And then we're going to start to see small little things begin to happen. Yeah. So, so Deanna, I want to, um, before we open up for questions, I'm going to, I'm going to put this, this little, um, you know, I went to a, a ivory tower and I work at one, um, and there's this fancy word called problematize to kind of uh, intentionally make problematic a traditional understanding of something. So maybe we can see what we've been missing. So Deanna, I'm going to put this out to everybody, but I'm interested in you answering because I know offline you share with us around some of the, the great things that you've been experiencing in your current place, which are coming from bold leadership. So we'll hear the words empower parents, empower community, um, get and give and teachers should pay more. And I'm going to say, I believe all of that. And here's the, here's how I'm going to problematize it, right? I can't empower you no more than I can push this building with my bare hands. That's it. So I might say that in this era of us not being in those brick and mortar buildings, perhaps folks have become more aware of what each person can do, assets people actually have to put into action, right? Um, because you can try to inspire me, but it doesn't translate into empowered action until I try to do something. And you're in a place where leadership is doing things. So mm -hmm. as we see pathways to get rid of the fence and what the fence symbolizes, and some people's fences look different than other school districts, but I wonder, Deanna, if you can share with us what you've experienced as like active solution oriented things that are happening to leave behind that problematic old. Sure. Um, yeah. And it's not just saying let's empower, but what does it look like in action? Yeah. yeah. So how do we dismantle these culturally destructive practices? Like how do we dismantle That's this? Not trash. Mm, come on. How do we knock it down? Right. Um, as educators, as school systems, we have to be real transparent and we have to admit that we have a bias. We can't create a more equitable space until we reflect on where we are. Secondly, we need to reduce or just eliminate race and gender barriers to learning, right? Diversify that curriculum. We also need to establish an inclusive environment. Establish an inclusive environment and then be dynamic with equitable engagement. So what we're doing in my space at my school, we are working on equity action plans. So we have all designated that key focus area to increase racial equity. And so now we're looking at individual practices, policies, behaviors, to then come up with action steps to address racial inequities. And this is some deep work. This is some, some deep stuff because you have to be transparent. You have to get like butt naked to realize Bobby doesn't have a box. Come on now. Bobby needs a box. And Man. the box is transformative. <laughs> Roberta There's got power in the box. Boxes. We got to be transparent to be like, and we've been giving Roberta 16 boxes for no reason. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's the so we all, yeah. yeah. So we all just need to go back to the sandbox and we need to think equity, but we need to look through the lens of equity and be real critical about it. I really appreciate that, that I had to type that in because I need to see that for myself. Be dynamic with equitable engagement. Those are not passive 
I can read them and feel inspired. Those are act, those are call every that's a call to action to be dynamic with equitable engagement, not thinking and putting hashtags up, not like uh, our faculty is going to read a book. God, right. all there is some amazing anti racism, anti black racism because we need to be specific sometimes. Okay, um, books and you can ask a teacher to read something, but that is not engaging and being dynamic. So I really want to get folks to think about that and um, the transparency, right? Like let's get butt naked. A lot of our schooling practices, a lot of the ways, and Kim, I'm going to pitch to you in this idea of recruitment um, is we, we don't really talk about the barriers that have been kind of normalized around what counts as um, somebody who should go into teaching. And so it's like, yeah, we don't see a lot of black teachers in some spaces. I know for uh, uh, where you all, where you all are, maybe it's not as um, uh, opposite, but there's a lot of this schooling gig that has made it normal to not see black women and black men. And I'm not one, I can't stand in the shoes one, but I know black men in education roles and leadership roles is very small. And we wonder what's happening with our young black boys in public education. So with, with the idea of recruitment as an actionable lever, and you said something, so my problem problematizing to you, Kimberly, is like, yes, we need qualified folks to get into the field. But if teaching programs are still preparing people with these antiquated, bias-based ways of thinking about schooling that criminalize black and brown bodies just for having the hair that they have to put my hair in your discipline policy and to then train me to enact that as violence. Okay. So we want to recruit more people and we want qualified teachers, but we still have teaching training programs that are problematic. So what's your like radical idea for how we can recruit people who are ready to turn some tables over. Jesus flipped the table, didn't he, right? So how can we recruit some table flipping teachers um, who are ready to get in with the little ankle biters, ready to get in with the families and the community? So part of my work in education was also an adjunct at University of Missouri St. Louis. Um, and I was able to work with um, teacher candidates for about eight years. And it was interesting, the conversations that we would have um, centering around race and gender. Um, and I would look into, you know, the, the pool of students that I would have, and they didn't even look like me. And it was, and so when they encountered me as their college professor, they were like, whoa, I was like a unicorn. And I'm like, why is this normalized? You know what I'm saying? It's like, I feel like we really have to be intentional with where we put our resources in order for the results to happen. I intentionally chose early childhood education because we have to have representation. Our babies need to see and feel us. And I'm not saying that um, white teachers can't do that. I'm just saying that children shouldn't go all the way up into upper elementary until they see a black woman or man as a teacher. But even in academia, we have to put ourselves in places of not just writing the books or even just teaching African-American studies. We also need to teach, you know, early childhood studies. We need to teach um, English studies, you know, we have to be in those spaces to say, to be able to choose the textbooks and be able to present it to our teachers as well. So in order for change to happen, we just have to insert ourselves in the places where we're, in, we're at least represented. Um, and it kind of trickled to my role um, being on the board of directors for Girls on the Run. Fabulous program, right? And when I started as a coach, but when I would go to the races, our 5K at the end of the season, I did not see a lot of black coaches. I did not see a lot of African-American girls participating in the program. So I thought to myself, hmm, how can I start making a radical change? And so the opportunity came for me to become on the board. 
And now with our awesome board members, executive the director, and the staff and the um, Girls in the Run St. Louis, we have, you know, part of our strategic plan recruitment, Black coaches. How are we going into schools that are majority African-American, right? So again, we have to be very mindful of what we do with our resources, with our actions, and what we do. For me, it's not about the money. You know what I'm saying? I think a lot of times people say, yes, teachers should be paid more. Of course we should, right? But also I think when we make it, when we make education in, uh, something important in the United States, that's where you're going to see the teacher pay go up. You know, we, yeah. we glorify athletics. We glorify entertainment. Mm -hmm. We glorify all this other stuff. But education is really not an important thing, right? Let's just be honest. Yeah. So those are some of the thing, you know, thoughts that I have as far as making um, a career in education something that would pique the interest of a high school student, you know, who loves to work with kids, right? But really not quite there yet. And then yeah. we need to really voice and say, hey, being a teacher is awesome. You know what I'm saying? Instead of, oh, I'm a teacher. I tell people all the time, yeah, I'm a teacher. I'm excited about it. Yeah, it has its peaks and valleys, but, you know, it's right. It's with anything. So I think we do also need to pump up our perfection up exactly. a little bit and not wait for other people to do it for us. Yes. Absolutely. True. I love that. Like, so um, true. we can't if we can't be in control of the narrative around what we do, we give license for other people to Correct. name it and mm -hmm. considerize it. And I will just say as a like um, sprinkling some seeds for another conversation that we definitely need to have. And that is really sticky and very complex, but it's the teacher pay school budget and what that has to do with tax dollars and real estate. Yeah. Um, it's all yeah. it is. It is so interconnected. So connected. I, mean, yeah. I agree every day of the week that teachers should be paid more. I think a lot of us do not understand what goes into the funding of 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 teacher pay and how yeah. that you know. So I think we also need to talk about that because and how even with that happening, something you're saying, Kimberly, that's so important. If you are called to be a teacher, you've also in those in that. You've got to own that you either love what you do and you stay in and you try it. If you don't, please create an exit. <laughs> yes. yes. We don't need you pooping on it. Okay. So yes. like if you a teacher and you pooping on teaching, <clears throat> there's a <laughs> post office or maybe I don't know. Okay. So La Alana, excuse me. <laughs> I shared a room with her for many years, folks. <laughs> <That's> all right. <laughs> okay. So Alana, in this solution oriented, like how do we move beyond the like super cliche fun things that are fun to put a, a pound sign in front of mm -hmm. thinking about equity, thinking about, you know, how that uh, might uh, relate to even um, some of the things you talked about in your joy and the things that you talked about that you found that immediately were, were not right. What's the, what's the possible thing we can do here now? Because because what we found out is that maybe maybe colleges really don't care about SATs and SATs as much. And I know that you are such a beautiful math mind. That whole movie was made about you. Okay, okay, okay. Let's keep it moving. <laughs> and I know that you've done tutoring, right? And so this is where it's like, ooh, uh, uh, you've done tutoring to help students with these standardized tests. But here we are in an era where colleges are now going, well, we've got to kind of suspend the standardized testing thing because of this global health pandemic. So if that is a possible lever to pull on where we can like get to a better normal, what is a solution oriented thing that you were thinking of or even visioning around how we make curriculum, um, be it math or otherwise, really pertinent to our students and not build it upon teaching to the test? Because we are years beyond, no child left beyond, but we are behind, but we are still swimming in the sticky residue and the other manifestations of that that have come out. So What's the solution around like I, I wanna I wanna keep it real, I want it to be transformative in the classroom with my students. If that's the space where you can be a change maker, 
what is it that you're thinking this is an opportunity for you to do around standardized testing? Oh boy. <laughs> um, I think for so long that I'm not going to say this so long. Well, since No Child Left Behind has, has come into play, um, you have these great teachers who are great thinkers, who are out-of-the-box thinkers, who have now, which we talked about when, when we were pre-planning, this little narrow space that you've now kind of put them into because of this test that they have to, that we have to teach you. I am a teacher that has to prepare students, even in the midst of this pandemic, I have to prepare students to take this test on June the 4th, okay? So my creativity um, sometimes I feel is limited because I gotta get these kids to pass the test. So a lot of the curriculum change, I guess, I don't wanna say unfortunately, it's really going to depend on, again, those people who have the pay grade that's way higher than ours to come down out of those offices and talk to us to get some plans to move away from what we're doing. So I can think of all of these great things to do in my classroom. Um, but if it is not SOL based, if I cannot relate it to this standardized test, then I am then stifled in a sense. And it has been kind of sad to see some of the teachers, even pre-COVID, their, their creativity has been stifled. Um, so this is kind of a tough one because I think that it's going to depend on the powers that be saying no more. I mean, really, no more. Because then when that is taken off of teachers, they can then say, oh, well, I can do that now. I can, you know, take my children on a field trip and, and show them how the distance formula works. I can take them um, to the football field and explain to them the Pythagorean theorem. Like, oh, I mean, and I mean, I really can still do that. But in my mind, in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking I got it. I got it. I got it. I can't be the teacher. They don't get all my kids to pass. I can't be that one. Right. And all of us kind of have that who teach. A, a core class like that, we have that in the back of our minds. The yeah. best teachers have that in the back of their mind. And so until the powers that be say, okay, we are we are pulling the plug on that. Not to say, and I want to say too, because some people say there needs to be some type of standard. I'm all for standards. Don't get me wrong. I don't think teachers need to be out here teaching all willy nilly. Right? I think that there needs to be some standards and what is your objective? But do I have to teach Side, angle, side, angle, side, angle, side, 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 hypotenuse leg. Do I, I have to do that? that? No, do I, have, do I have to teach that in order to show that my children are competent in the field of geometry? I say no. I say no. So while I have all these great ideas, and I'm sure there's some other educators on here who have great ideas, we are still, unfortunately, I don't want to, I mean, and I'm not being negative, it's just the truth, bound by a test. And so though I do believe in the next couple years that the test will slowly go away, what you then will have to do is re-educate your teachers. So they will, I don't want to say re-educate them, give them the green light to say it is okay to be you because a lot of them have been down to right. the test. So I think the curriculum changing and being more equitable is going to be those people who make the curriculums to involve us who teach the curriculum yeah. to have some input. And, and I want to, I want to say on that, um, and just want to say, if folks have any questions or comments, like keep them coming. We see it. There's a lot yeah. of buying. I hope Kimberly, Deanna, and Alana that you all are checking and getting all this love. Yeah. And I want to say to that, uh, Alana, because it's a good point around like those people at the pay grades above and they're high. Like, so let's, you know, I'm a, <clears throat> I wear, I have pink colored glasses, but I also know that I exist in this, in this dimension. Right. And so the reality is there is no actual incentive for them to come into your classrooms and feel affected and inspired and make change. The actual policy makers are you all. It's everybody in the sandbox. It's the teachers in the classroom. It's the radical administrators like Deanna that you're working with. 
that are never going to be sent from some pod in 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 utopia to it's gonna be like I forget who I I, I want to attribute this, but um, what kind of trouble are you willing to make, right? Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean you're gonna stage a protest with your students and walk out and burn bras and have a die in, maybe. But it also could be Alana something that I want to give you credit for very publicly is saying, you know what? Here's the policymaker that I am in my space. I can design my classroom in a way that actually respects the humanity of my students have different lighting, different seating, because this industrialized education that we're left with, these form that literally has roles like, I'm sorry, we all people of color. Indigenous folks, we don't do roles, we do circles. We are people of the cipher. We are people who gather, who lean in, who rock, who sway when we hug. We are not your third, your man forward only. Also, that's not good for our students who have very high abilities to, to attend to multiple things. They need multiple stimuli. So you, teacher of the year, it's not going to happen if you're steady, right? So all that to say that, Alana, you are doing things. And I want to make sure that people hear that they can be, there are things that you can do. So the radical change might not look like, and in nine months, we changed all the curriculum to be completely anti-racist and to be completely culturally relevant. But you designed your classroom in a way where your students felt heard, held, and seen. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. I want to remind people that the, 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 the territory of your classroom can be a radically transformative space. You modeled for students and the feedback that you get, not from an SOL, which is simply SOL, simply out of luck, but the feedback that you get from your students and your parents immediately around how they feel heard and seen and are learning and that's haphazard, that is data. And you continue to be that type of radical change maker you don't know someone else is going to feel it and go, you know, I've had students I've shared about your classroom. They're like, you know what? I could change the layout of my classroom. It's that simple. Yeah. Right. Or like to prep for the test. Maybe I see this curriculum over here, but I know my students need to listen to music to let them get it. So yeah. I, I, you know, there are confines, right. And we're not in, in, in unicorn land. Right. You know, yeah. and black women stay being like the, the, the lead troublemakers and everything. But there is something that everybody, regardless of your race, regardless of your gender, regardless of your ethnicity, your ability, your class, your station, you do have the territory of some space to do something, right? And yes. Kimberly, also, when we were planning for this, um, to talk about community engagement, like also, folks, you know, there is nothing that is apolitical. And I don't know, somebody can correct me and help me out if it was Audrey Lord or um, Bell Hooks, but like nothing is apolitical. Nothing mm-hmm. is teaching is not a political, right? People are always making policies. So therefore, something we're doing, somebody wants to say is right or wrong, and we'll make it a law, right? Mm-hmm. So in that, you all are policy makers. It might take the people a few pay grades ahead of you a bit to, to get that, but you're policy makers. There are politics that are happening all around us around what matters and what doesn't, but you all are evident, right? And while you're getting, you know, Kimberly, you're getting people to sign petitions. Like we know we it takes people to affect laws. Our system is flawed. I don't know what that feedback is, but our system is flawed. But we do have some checks and balances so that lawmakers can't just willy nilly do anything anytime they want. Right. So getting people to sign a petition, Kimberly, getting parents to get signatures, know who your school board, like Lana, I know you've shown up to some school board meetings. I know there's some parents who didn't maybe think about family engagement until this year. Right. So that's one of the beautiful nuggets. There's some families going, wait, hold up. Y'all going to send our babies back with no mask. Wait a minute. Who we need to call? So I want to say that I'm not a parent. But that right there is civic engagement. Yes, let's, that is family engagement, right? So everything isn't lost here. Everything isn't lost. I just want to make sure that people know, like, it's not perfect. But right now, what we learned, right, that schools can give kids Chromebooks. I'm just waiting for Apple to be like, actually, we can give everybody a MacBook. Let's not make this a PC or an Apple challenge. Just saying Chromebooks got limitations, the ones that they give students. So we learned that we can give students Chromebooks when we say you absolutely can't come in the building for a whole year. So therefore, what I'm saying, deductive math reasoning, there there is enough, there isn't an access to to laptop issues. 
that was an intentional wedge. So the gig is up. That car has been pulled, right? You know, um, a lot of people have created curriculum online for free around culturally relevant pedagogy, around anti-racist teaching, around what it means to be an ally or an accomplice. You better throw some of that into your syllabus. They got from, from early childhood books up to doctoral. Yeah. Put it in the syllabi. Come on, y'all. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say piggybacking on that. You know, another word that we have really heard as well is being intentional. I think uh, Deanna and Kim, I think all of us may have said it as well. You have to be intentional. You have to be. Like when, when the school year starts, I'm intentional. So people say, well, how, how do you build relationships so well with your students? I'm intentional. I don't care what they look like. I don't. I am intentional about building relationships with my students from day one. So that when we hit the bumpy roads, not if, when we hit the bumpy roads, there is a respect level there that will help us <laughs> get over those bumpy levels, right? So I think the word intentional is super, super, super important. Intentional about your curriculum being um, diverse, even in math. You know, how do you do that? <laughs> Listen, if I don't know how to do it, I'm going to figure it out. Right. Even if it's just putting up a black mathematician, even if it's just talking about um, different things of that sort, I can at least do that. So whether you teach math, science, English, um, history, fill in the blank, your electives, it doesn't matter. When you go to think about your lessons, you have to be intentional. School districts have to be intentional. Everyone has mm -hmm. to be intentional. Yeah, because all of this that we're in right now, listen, I'm not about to be here on no conspiracy theory or anything like that, but there is nothing that is random when we yeah. talk about systems. You know, systems of oppression paid attention to every nook and cranny. That's why it's going it takes so much to undo. Yes. So true. You know, so true. Yes. Yes. I didn't realize how hard it would be to get back in shape. I didn't know that getting out of shape was so accidentally <laughs> intentional. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. That's my own, that's my <laughs> own mess for me, my, yes. son, my personal trainer. Okay. <laughs> so, um, to wrap, um, you know, y'all, this is just episode one. We we definitely gonna come back come back here again. And I just want to say thanks to everybody who's been um in the comments uh this whole time. Um and yes, thank you. awesome. Um, thank you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask our panelists one final question. So this one is we've looked at the past where you all started. Um we've looked at the now, what's been exposed, and what you all are thinking are actual lovers <laughs> moving forward. So now we're gonna go to um we're gonna go a little bit to utopia we've been in zoomtopia so maybe utopia is just one mouse click away we don't know so imagine it ladies oprah bill and melinda gates elon musk jeff Bezos, and jay-z put all of their monies together and said money ain't an option you have to do, you have to create one thing. What's your one thing that you're going to create? Money's not an option. The one thing that you're going to create or the one thing you're going to enact to help move education forward to a truly liberated experience. What's that one thing? So don't talk about, oh, you know, if I have money, you can buy, make as many books. You can build a new city. What's the one thing y'all going to do? I would say uplift the communities because we can't have a standalone school with all this bright technology and, you know, razzle dazzle within the community around it is crumbling. So I would say invest the money in the community, you know, um, take away the liquor stores and the convenience stores that's selling shots of 
coding to children. Let's move those out the way. Let's create some green spaces. <laughs> Let's create some green spaces, some safe places for children to play outside, right? Some community gardens. So let's uplift the whole community so that when you invest in the community, you're also invested into its residents and you're invested into um, the future. So I would just say uplift the community. Thanks. Mine would be twofold. So creating literacy centers, literacy hubs, and also social emotional wells because we need it. The society needs it with mental illness, mental attacks. And I see it every year, younger, 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 you know, third grade, second grade. And it's like, what's going on? But I do believe when the village is whole, the children are whole. You yeah. hear me? Yeah. When the village is broken, the children are broken. Yeah. I, I don't even know. Huh? Stop down. I, I don't. <laughs> this has just been beautiful. I don't really know what to add because literally I was going to say, Deanna, the literacy uh, hubs or whatever you said, girl. <laughs> I don't even know what to say because I think I, I've always envisioned kind of what Kim was saying. If I if I, if money wasn't an object. People may say, oh, we'll pay the teachers. Well, okay, yes. I, I kind of vision what Kim said in creating some community togetherness. I don't know how else to put that. I've always envisioned wanting to build a community center that would encompass, obviously, the after-school activities. It would be open. If I could keep it open 24 hours, I would but it would encompass, uh, Deanna, what you're saying. So there would be tutoring there. There would be social, emotional help there, not only for students, but if some teachers needed to come in, that we could have something available to them as well. That we, ha we would have the recreational piece as well. So, you know, you're kind of your why feel, um, but it also would be very educational. Students could come there uh, to prepare for the SAT and ACT. And we know that those may be, doing whatever, but help them prepare. They want to take the ASVAB. They want to take the G, uh, the, the GD. Uh, we got some, um, we got some, um, what do you call? I can't even think. Um, training classes for students who may not go to four-year institutions. Um, I have envisioned like this 24-hour center that encompasses what you said, Kim, and that what encompasses what you said, Deanna, because I believe if the community is built up, it's the the, the carryover, the, the spill, you know, it's going to spill over into our places of education. One last thing, I think we all said this as well. I think one thing that COVID has shown is that education cannot be thought to just happen inside of a brick building. Come on, say we that. Have to, we have to dismantle this thought that my child can't learn because they're not sitting in rows in front of a teacher. We have to dismantle that. And I hope that we begin after COVID <laughs> to understand that education is ongoing. I, yes, am your geometry teacher. I am tasked with teaching you geometry, but that does not mean you have to wait for Ms. Johnson to learn. You don't. I am that, that is my my specialty. Don't get me wrong. You know, Kim's early education, De Deanna has special, special education. We are specialized. That does not mean uh, my kid ain't learning because they're not in school. Let's scratch that. Let's scratch that. And let's rethink how learning can happen. That's why the community is so important. Yes. Right? Because if the God forbid if the school shuts down again for some other reason, oh, we, please can't don't. Be, we can't be saying, oh, my kid is not in school, so it's the teacher fault. No, we got to get out of that mindset. It's not. It's a community Absolutely. effort. When the village is broken, the school is going to feel it. When the village is strong, the school is going to feel it. So as we close out, I just want people who, you know, who are listening 
we need to change our mindset as to what the expectation is of education as far as teachers like we are going to give a thousand percent man <laughs> but we have to realize we're not swiss army knives no man some of the some of the teachers are burnt out from being swiss army knives, army knives. it's yes. now time for everybody to take up their backpack and get in where you fit in to make this educational experience the best that we can possibly make it Otherwise, we're going to look up. We're not going to have any more great teachers because we're all, our That's knives right. are done. Yeah. So done, just, done. We're saying, we, yes, we need more finances and funding, but let's start to work with what we have and change our mentality of how learning happens. My student, Ms. Johnson, I don't know how to do that. Oh, okay. Guess what you got? Google.com. Okay. <laughs> um, Google may never lie. So if you can so this, this this whole notion that they can't learn, like I, I can get a PhD online. And, and let's let's just let's just keep it real here. <laughs> I don't I it is not accidental that the vision that all of y'all went to had to do with community. And it's not accidental that what you all have said actually already exists. Uh-huh. Let me show you how. Uh raise your hand if you've seen the 24 hour CVS or Walgreens. Raise your hand if you've seen a 24-hour Walmart. Raise your hand if you've seen a 24-hour fitness, a 24-hour laundromat, a 24-hour food place. We have 24-hour places that serve and things that are tied to consumer transactions. So we actually know how to do this. A 24 Holistic hour systems. Holistic systems. Holistic systems. We know how to do this already. So when we ask, the point of like being so explicit and like naming these billionaires is to for us to also remember and not to, as Lisa Nichols, the, the speaker will say, not to exceptionalize other people's success. Because just because Oprah has a billion dollars doesn't mean that the ability to create a 24 hour something is not within each of us and those that are gathered. That is old original technology. That's old original currency of creativity. And then not just having the thought, but again, activating it, right? And so, all that you all have said is not only possible, it's happening. We just have to be intentional. And I would say none of us want to be in a situation where we are so socially removed from people because we are social creatures. If nobody ever thought that, I think you know now. We are social, communal, spiritual beings first who are putting to these vessels able to have transactional experiences. But if something happens that removes us from school buildings, Notice the difference. Education and schooling are also not synonyms. Mm. So true. Mm -hmm. so true. Mm -hmm. Schooling is an experience that was yes. designed, manipulated by men to privilege some over others. Education yes. Teach us. In the barbershop, in the beauty salon, it happens in families. Some of my first teachers are on this call, Alana and I shared room. There are things you ever see two siblings learn from each other. I love watching the ankle biters, Kimberly. <laughs> Five-year-old teacher, three-year-old something is the most pure form of education. Yes. Yes. What we've done is created this enterprise called schooling to strip people away from their original divine selves and make them think that they don't know how to research. Students, teenagers are brilliant researchers. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Ask them what's trending. They'll give you a whole three-hour feed. That's research. But yeah. so we have to realize that we all are equipped with these amazing abilities to do and be the solution that we're looking for. Amen. It's yes. nice to have Oprah, Jeff, Gates, Jay-Z, Yonsei, all of their money. And at the same time, folks, the ingenuity is already here. It's there. It's yes. And so we can do it. You all are already doing it in the ways that you are in. And I am encouraging and holding my sisters accountable so let's push it. Let's Amen. It. Let's push it to the next push level. It. Let's not go reverse. Let's not make a U-turn to those old practices happening in schooling that were damaging to students, teachers, administrators, and fact and, and families. Let's push forward. Yes. Let's push yes. forward. Yes. So I just want to say, Kimberly, Alana, Diana, y'all are the queens. Y'all are the champs. 
I can't wait for us to come up with episode two through how yes. the community that was with us. I'm excited. Yes. This is just oh, thank the you. beginning. Thank you, boss lady. We can talk I, about this I, for I, hours. Yeah. yeah not, the talk is not just talk, right? Right. We have yeah. to, we have yeah. And now let's be dope about it. Let's yeah. be absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's time to start making those yes. small waves. And yeah. um, Aisha, we just want to thank you for being yes. a great moderator, for um, putting all of your little expertise. Um, thank you to all the people. Um, I couldn't keep up with everything that was going in the chat. And I know some people left. But thank you all for joining in, for engaging in the conversation and you are part of this community everyone oh, who, who got feet. on this call every, Not, look at the chat melissa armitage mrs johnson has made oh uh, hi melissa oh, oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much i i was just going to say um yeah thank you for all of those who are on here thank you for our families whether we're single thank married, you kids, no kids Thank you to our support systems who I know get tired of us yapping our mouths about education, but they know that there is a reason. Thank you for, uh, I, I know there were some teachers from my current school on and um, Melissa Armitage, I taught her kids like it, it really takes a village. It takes a village, y'all. And we are the village. We I, are the village. That's the I thing. We are the village. We are the village, and and the village is 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 a lot of us in it. And it's not just about though. We do have racial issues. We do. We didn't dive in that. Next time, we'll talk more about some of those those issues as well. But we are in a village that is comprised of different shades of people, and it's beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. All can Beautiful. learn and grow from each other. It is a community effort. So I just want to say thank you to everybody, Deanna and Kim and Aisha. Thank you, and thank everybody you. Everybody who stopped oh. by. We are so again. thank you, Ebony. Ebony was in the chat all the time. Thank you, Erica. Yes, on. thank you. Thank you, everybody. On because I don't know, I can't, I don't know what's happening on YouTube, but thank you so much. We are I am energized. I'm on spring break right now. Uh, Me too. A couple more days. I'm gonna get them there while you can. Yeah, and I am energized to go back. Monday. Yeah, to go back to my students and give it all that I have because it is difficult right now. I'm in a hybrid situation. Shout out to all the teachers. Teachers. Shout out to all the teachers, whether you're teaching face to face, virtual, or both. Here we are. You are the real MVPs. Don't yes, you up. are. Like yes. the administrators. Yes. Everybody who's making this school, the custodial staff, you are the real like the announcement person at church, right? You know, <laughs> this year. Every line of the announcement. <laughs> yes, but seriously, like no, this, no, we we want to, we also want to give people some of that evening back. Yes, because I haven't even eaten, eaten, eaten yet. So yes, but thank yes. you so much. Thank you, everybody. And please, um, again, this is just the start. We'd love to continue these conversations where we can identify topics and be solution oriented because we don't want to just have this be a venting session. There really is, yes. even in the midst of everything that is going on, there is an opportunity for all of us to truly be dope, to be doing the one or two or three things that we can do to dismantle these unjust systems and push forward knowledge because knowledge doesn't have anything to do with a brick and mortar building. Amen. We we can act on knowledge that can bring us into a greater place of liberation and joy. So again, Kimberly Berry, Alana Johnson, Deanna Ash, my Black Panther queen. Woo! 314, let's go. 314, I'm going to ask that. Thanks, fam. I'm going to ask the panelists to stay on. But for those who joined us, uh, peace out. We'll release the links to this um, in the next day or so. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.